Yep. Share. One second. And then. Okay. Is it okay like this? Everybody can see? Okay. I hope. Yeah. See no uh, false messages. So uh, I'm I'm uh, glad to be the first one talk, and uh, I will give a little bit of an overview on uh, complications, complication management. Uh, but it's difficult to because I, I always wondered why uh, why Jay asked me uh, to talk about complications that only other people make. Um, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, First of all, I was very glad that Scotland uh, was uh, uh, against uh, the Brexit, but I, I, I learned now that it is inev inevitable to happen. So we are very curious what's going to happen. And, uh, but I'm not really, really looking forward to it. Um, as a disclosure, my department receives uh, grants from, uh, from Atos, but also from other, other um, institutions, of course. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, first um, uh, a few general things about complications and the need for uniformity. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll mention the Clavian, uh, Clavian Dindo classification, which in general surgery is now the most commonly used uh, classification system. I'll focus a little bit on a few complications after laryngectomy that um, I published on and, and uh, there is a lot of uh, issues about that. And then I will end on how to improve our quality and, uh, and a little bit on our national audits. So first of all, I think uh, for everybody who's in the audience, I think nobody wants to have complications. I think there's not any surgeon or doctor who wants to have complications. So we try to prevent them. Everybody does his best. So also when you are in legal issues, uh, I think you should always believe that nobody did this uh, on purpose and everybody wants to avoid complications, of course. A few things uh, to do uh, to remember is uh, before you do an operation, always check the patient, the sites. Of course, we know of all the other people who made the mistakes, but even I, when I was a resident, I remember having done a septoplasty and, and then I was doing the, the um, administration and it was in a different patient file. And I thought, oh, I did the wrong operation, wrong. Fortunately, fortunately the file was changed and not the patient, but uh, these things should not happen, of course. Um, patients have to be uh, pr uh, informed properly. I think that's very important. Uh, and you have to have the proper information as well. And are you equipped? Are you more experienced enough? And is your hospital experienced enough to do this? And uh, all your nurses? So all these things have to be taken into account. Well, a little bit about categorizations. Um, there are many categorizations of complications. If you read the literature, um, you can, can categorize them like uh, in this slide, like general complications, cardiac, lung, lung embolism, whatever. So the more general complications from any surgery and the specific intraoperative ones, like nerve injuries, brain injury, vessel injury, kind leakage, the post-operative ones, uh, bleeding fistulas. But you can also categorize them on the consequences they have. And that's becoming more and more um, uh, in vague, I think. Um, um, so the consequences, how, how severe were these complications? Then you, then you put them in one type of operation, you categorize the consequences. And that's in fact what the, sur the surgeons did, because if you categorize them with specific uh, complications per surgery, it's much more difficult to, to compare institutions, to compare um, complications. So this, these consequences are now the, the key point. And that's the Clavian Dindo um, categorization, which is there already for many years. And but it has not been so popular in Hellenic surgery. And in the Netherlands, we're trying to implement it. Um, and um, it uses the interve intervention, of course, to look at, and then it grades the severity of the complication, which I think it's, it leads too far to, to, to go over everything. But um, uh, you can imagine that there is a grade one until grade five, and the grade five is death of the patient. Um, and then you have all these intermediate things. Um, it is not always easy. Uh, to grade them on based on these classifications and I'll show you one publication from uh, the Toronto group uh, where I did my fellowship a long time ago in 1995 um, and you can see here they, they asked the panel of doctors to to grade a couple of complications 
And for example, if you see post-laryngectomy fistula requiring wound opening and daily packing at the bedside, so no re-intervention, you can see that 21% graded it as grade one, 47 as grade two, and 31 as grade three A. So apparently it's not as easy, uh, um, and it's of course not made for uh, all head and neck uh, procedures. So there is a big need. This is a publication from 2014. There's a big need to get more uh, a common grading uh, and uh, less variation in this uh, classification system. But I think it, um, because we recently wrote a, p a publication on complications after neck dissection, after chemo radiation, so for uh, selfish neck dissection, and we looked at the literature and it's almost impossible to make meta-analysis or anything because nobody uses the same grading system. Now switch a little bit to a laryngectomy uh, because that is an example I would like to give um, on um, applications and um, uh, if you read this, um, this article, which um, is uh, a meta-analysis of complications in many patients, more than 3,000 patients, more than 50 studies, and you see that two-thirds of the laryngectomies are, um, have complications, which of course is incredible. And um, I think um, it's really something we have to work on. It's, it's maybe also a big argument uh, uh, to centralize uh, these kind of surgeries. But you can see here, the, what are the complications? Well, in all these studies, on average, 30% fistulas, 40% strictures of the new pharynx, 80% stoma stenosis, 40% uh, wound infection, dehiscences, and then you have bleedings and chyle leakages. So, well, many of these are surgery related. They cannot always be prevented, but I think we should really work on that. And in the end of my talk, I'm gonna go come back a little bit on what, what we can do to improve this. Um, well, let's focus a little bit on fistulas. Um, there is a lot of literature and still coming out on uh, laryngectomy fistulas because no surgeon ever wants to have a fistula, of course, but we, we all have to deal with it. And there are many risk factors uh, attributed to it, like uh, pre-operative chemo radiation or radiotherapy, hypopharynx, the extent of neck dissection, the, um, the, the extent of the pharyngectomy, comorbidities, of course, and timing of oral intake, maybe, and many more. And these are just an overview of the literature. I'm going to show you a little bit what we looked at in my institution. Um, uh, we found an incident this, that is quite comparable to the literature, uh, 23%, uh, 26%. And you can see here in primary laryngectomy without radiotherapy it was 17, but in the salvage it was already 26, and in the second primary tumor it was 38, and in the dysfunctional larynx, so if you do a laryngectomy for a functional reason, it was uh, 44. So you can see there is certainly also a risk on the indication. Um, Let's skip these uh, grams. What, what you can see about the treatment of the fistulas, well, on average, uh, half of them are reoperated, uh, and the other ones are just managed conservatively. Um, this was the risk analysis that we did, which came out exactly the same as the literature. Hypopharynx is worse. Um, Preoperative albumin level, but you can also look at preoperative uh, hemoglobin or other comorbidity scales. Uh, they all are risk factors. Uh, salvage laryngectomy is a risk factor, uh, sorry. And uh, the amount of pharyngectomy you do is also important. So these are the, the known risk factors. What we also found is that even uh, if you look at comparable um, uh, surgeries, like with and without neck dissection, with and without reconstruction, the time uh, of the surgeon, so the amount of minutes the surgery took was important. And this is of course, it's difficult to really um, take the subgroup that you have slow surgeons or more complicated surgery, so that's always difficult, but it is our impression, and there's also other literature like in hip replacements that uh, fast surgeons have less complications because there's just less time to get infection, I think. Um, an open wound um, uh, is more prone to give, to give post-operative problems um, than a quick surgery. Um, what we also looked extensively into is, uh, is timing of oral intake. And um, because when I, I changed the protocol in the Netherlands Cancer Institute about some, some 10 years ago, 
because I found out that um, our patient, our general surgeons gave, started oral intake much quicker than we did. We always waited for 10 days in those days. And uh, so I changed it. So, so we went into a protocol that we started in principle the first day after 24 hours with water and then gradually increasing liquid intake. And then on uh, day 14, we started uh, with solid foods. And we looked at the incidence of uh, fistulas. And um, so this is the fistula incidence. So in the old protocol, waiting for 10 days, we had 26% and in the new protocol, it was, it was 33%. So certainly not an improvement, but it was also no significant difference. So we've now implemented it and um, we start uh, intake much earlier. And also then you can discharge your patients earlier, of course. And uh, very recently, there was a, a nice um, uh, meta-analysis and a, a review, so it was just published. Um, uh, so, and um, I didn't put the, the journal in there, so a little bit stupid. Um, and anyhow, this was our study, uh, but you can see many studies and you can see uh, the risk uh, ratio of um, uh, to get fistulas was in general reported even less with early oral intake. We had a little bit more, but on average, uh, there was certainly no difference in uh, in fistula rate when you start early oral intake. And this was the incidence in studies with high proportions of cell with slam injection, like ours, because uh, some uh, studies did not really report um, uh, the amount of cell with slam injection. So I think we can conclude that early oral intake has no real influence. Now, this is a, is a, is a recent study um, that we did uh, because I always thought, of course, like every driver in a car thinks he has the, the, he's the best driver. Every surgeon thinks he's, he doesn't have a lot of fistulas. So I was curious in my own institute and I compared all the surgeons and I couldn't find a difference. Everybody had fistulas. And then I thought we should do this nationwide. So uh, we have uh, a couple of big centers, all the university centers in the Netherlands. We're a small country with a nice cooperation. And so we retrospectively looked at the fistula rate in the last three years, uh, three or four years. And you can see here the fistula rate in one center was only 9.6% and in other centers it was 35 or 37%. So I was a little bit shocked and I thought, well, if I go back with these results, um, probably they will not allow me to publish it. Uh, because um, uh, it's, of course, also a little bit, um, yeah, it's not nice to see that you have much higher rates than other ones. Uh, so um, uh, what we did is we made a, a, first we, out of these results, because it was a couple of hundred patients, uh, we made a model predicting fistulas. So hyperferous cancer, reconstruction, comorbidities, all these things you put in the model, and then you predict the fistula rate based on the whole population. And then you see the predicted fistula rate, which is the, this column. You can see it's, uh, it is already more together. It's now more like uh, 30 for 25. Only this center still is much better, but they have a lower fistula rate than predicted. So they are better surgeons than predicted. Uh, and the other ones, but also the 37 one, he, he had a more difficult patient population. So they had probably more self fistula injectomies than this center. And um, so we could, we could for partly explain the high fistula rate in this and this center, for example, because they just had a more difficult patient population. But still, some centers do better in, compared to pre their predicted rate and some do worse than predicted rate. So I think we can still learn from each other because if you give this as a feedback to the center, they say, well, we're not doing as good as expected. So we should work on it. So for example, things that changed, um, uh, this center of 37 did a lot of staplers uh, and vertical closures. And they started doing, because they only did T-shaped uh, closures. Also, these high centers did always elective neck dissections, and they did not do elective neck dissections in all patients. So Things, and they did not have a higher uh, um, a neck recurrence rate. So things we can learn from. And um, so what, a little bit more in general, so what can we work on now? And um, uh, the, the, the Dutch Medical Specialty Association, they, they have, uh, have made a program. And I think we, we, we are trying to go in line with that. 
uh, they, they say in 25, we have to be uh, among the most innovative and best uh, uh, healthcare systems in the world. So more safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, equit equitable. Well, so this was a vision document that we made. I was also in this board. And um, it all started a little bit. Maybe that's nice for uh, certainly the young people to know that uh, at least he is quoted a lot for this, Mr. Cotman in, in, um, in the United States, in, I think in Harvard. Um, and um, he had a, uh, he, he lived uh, so 100 years ago, uh, which is not so long ago. Uh, and he was uh, finally um, uh, fired from his institution uh, because he had too much criticism on the way the doctors were working. And um, he was in fact fired because of this uh, drawing that he made. And he said, the doctors, they are not, how they put the, like, a, uh, like an ostrich, uh, ostrich, put their head uh, in the sand. They don't want to look at the complication. They just look at the eggs that come out, so the golden eggs. And the board of directors is not looking critically. And um, he made this cartoon, and he was fired for that. But he was the first one who said that doctors have to really look into their work and not work only for uh, money. Um, and uh, so, uh, so this vision document said that um, doctors should work not for a privileged dominant position in healthcare, but they have to show leadership, uh, become more patient-centered and a very open culture, also on complications, of course. And um, so th there was a, a plan made with all kinds of feedback loops, um, and we have to work according to guidelines. I think most people in the world do that. They have to be as much as possible evidence-based. Uh, formulate do's and don'ts, uh, diminish practice variation, so look at other people, how they do it, how many uh, surgeries they do, and uh, define the knowledge gap. And I know that in Britain they're also working a lot on that. Uh, shared decision making, so we are also working on this, we try to make shared decision making on a lot of things in oncology. Quality measurements, external peer review and education are important things. So a little bit about practice variation. Um, uh, already uh, uh, one or two decades ago, uh, Stephen Hall from um, uh, uh, Canada, from Ontario, uh, not in Toronto, but he, he was in London, I think. Uh, he compared a lot of policies in different countries and different hospitals. He compared a lot Canada to the United States, but also now he compared Ontario to Norway in this publication. And uh, this was for oropharyngeal and oral cancer. And you can see enormous differences in primary treatments like radiation, uh, almost 80%, uh, 36 and, um, in oral cancer, uh, 50 to 20. So a lot of differences in indications. And also over time, there was a lot of differences. Um, this is in 1990 and this is in 2000. You see the amount of chemo radiation and radiotherapy and this is surgery. So, well, he showed all kinds of practice variations in time and place and looked also at different outcomes. And uh, this, in this publication, for example, he compared a couple of institutes in Ontario uh, who had more residual disease and more relapses. So really there is some variation. You better be treated here than here, of course. So we know these things and we should work on it. So also in, in the Netherlands, we did this study from my institute. Uh, we looked at variation in, in the Netherlands. Um, and um, this table, don't look at everything, but um, uh, this was the hazard ratio for death. And we look, for example, if there is one uh, thing that came out is the hospital volume. And the hospital volume, if you look at all tumors together, uh, it was significant. So if you were, are treated in a high volume hospital, you just have more chance to survive your cancer than in low volume. So also these studies are important, I think. Now and then, uh, because of all these variations and these outcomes, and because we want to work on quality, we started the, the, the Dutch Head and Neck Audit, which um, uh, since uh, very recently, it was started, of course, earlier, but it takes a lot of time to put up these databases and get consensus and all the legal issues with the, with the pri private uh, things and these, these European laws are terrible. So, but all the 14 centers that we have uh, are obliged now to put in all their patients and data. And we have 200 parameters per patient, also from SPREMS. And at the moment in many hospitals, it's still done by data tapis, but we are now working on fully automated data extraction from the electronic patient file. And we hope next year or the, or the year after that will be ready. 
And then the thing is we get feedback and each year we get more feedback because we just very recently on a couple of things. Um, and the, the things we get, we uh, information on our structure indicators like the number of cases we treat, uh, the process indicators like uh, the patients discussed in the board or the waiting times, and the outcome indicators like uh, failure, death, uh, recurrence, um, all kinds of complications. Um, and to give you a few examples of the data that we get, and sometimes, um, and the, the thing, the, the graphs that you get are, are shown like this. Um, so this is the number of cases that you do. All the, the dots are the centers, and you only see your own dots. The, the red dot, you know who you are, and the other ones, uh, the, the, this institute will get this dot as a red dot. So I don't know who these other institutes are, but I can compare um, uh, it. So this is, for example, the patients that completed uh, a curative chemoradiation. So, um, uh, and they had three cycles of chemotherapy, whatever. So all these information you get, uh, for example, here patients starting treatment within 30 days, because we have a guideline that 80% of the patients should start within 30 days after the first visit. Well, you can see that 80% is not obtained by any center. On average, it was like maybe 60%, and this was my center, so also we did not very good. So you know you have to work on it, and also you can use this to go to your hospital and say, well, we just need more capacity because we are just not doing as good as the other centers. This is patients starting post-operative radiotherapy within six weeks. Also, um, well, we see we are not as good because we, our waiting lists are just too long. And this is, for example, the patients with the free flap failure, the percentage, well, fortunately, the, 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 the percentage is, uh, is low, but, um, um, uh, but you can compare yourself. So all these things you get on a, on a three monthly basis and it gives you very nice feedback. So, well, um, to, to end my presentation, I, I think uh, I've shown you a little bit what, what uh, complications are, are, what we can do about it, and some figures. I think it is important to have complication discussions in your hospital. Uh, so we have that every month, uh, talk about compl complications and also failures. But I think that was the first step. It was already, already when I was a fellow in Toronto in 1995. I was impressed because in Toronto they had that already. And um, I know that Pat Boulain always had the most complications, but he also had the most uh, difficult surgeries. Uh, but then um, I think the next steps, of course, are also discussed, uh, like in the, the flight industry, like the pilots, also discuss near complications. Um, so it, finally it went okay, but what did we do wrong? It, it could have gone wrong. And, um, and we should work on, on the next steps. I think it is important after every, uh, maybe also after a clinic, but certainly after a surgery, discuss with all the team what went wrong, what went good, and what could have been done better or faster or more effectively, and, and make this, um, uh, and also maybe complement each other. So just create an atmosphere that you said, well, you did this surgery very well, and um, uh, I learned from you or whatever, and make this a kind of routine in all aspects of care. I think that's the most important lesson. So thank you uh, for your attention. I stop sharing. Oops. So if there are questions, I think it's open for questions, huh, Jay? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I got some questions actually um, from the feedback and the chat. How to minimize the variation, um, even in a department or in the country? Um, what are the steps you can take to minimize the variation? We all know variation in practice is, is not good um, on the best interest of the patient. Yeah, well, I think very important question. And um, uh, I think uh, it is not good to work too much with penalties and, um, and uh, whatever. Uh, I think feedback on, on variation uh, diminishes variation. We've seen that uh, our surgeons in the Netherlands and also in Britain, our programs, they started doing this much earlier, like uh, uh, leakages and, uh, of, of, the, of the bowels. And, and what they saw is when they give the feedback to the hospitals, um, and, they, and you, you see that your hospital with your team is having more leakage uh, or more fistulas than the other team, 
everybody starts thinking, what do I do wrong? So you, you start looking, you visit the other clinics um, and you work on the problem. And what the surgeons have shown that if you give this, uh, every year you will see an improvement of the figures. And of course, there has been comment also that it is also dangerous for a patient because if you get a very difficult patient, uh, who is more likely to have a complication, uh, then uh, he might, the surgeon might say, well, I don't treat you anymore. So that's a risk. So there should be a, a case mix correction uh, made. And that's also very important because um, I think I, sh I, sh I show you some, showed you, for example, the fistula, some failure, flap failure, it was not so high, but it was still, our flap failure was higher than in some other centers. That's also because we get a lot of salvage because it's a cancer institute. It's a, uh, uh, you, so you get a lot of uh, failures from others. Um, so that could be an excuse. Um, so it's important to correct for this case mix. But I think just giving feedback um, and because the, there is also a tendency to say you cannot do, for example, uh, a laryngectomy if you don't do 10, at least 10 or 20 a year. So that's also a policy you could, you could uh, look at. Huh? Uh, uh, the surgeons have looked into that. But they came a little bit back to it uh, because it gives a lot of uh, resistance and uh, you take away also the, the, the money and the, the, the living of doctors. So it's very difficult to do that. But if you just measure the quality and the complications and you give it back and then if somebody is really doing a bad job, of course, you will have to, you will have, to have mechanism to go to him and say, well, do another fellowship or uh, stop doing this, yeah. It's a, there's another question. Uh, it's very similar. I think you touched um, moderately uh, about the volume and the more centers, uh, like more patients you do, your complications rates are less. Is that true or is it should be implemented or is it against um, national practice? Yeah, it's first of all, um, uh, it has been proven to be, uh, in principle, the best. Yeah. Uh, in head and neck, there are also a couple of studies, but in, in other uh, areas, there have been really big pro Like prostate cancer huh, is, is much more common than head and neck cancer. Uh, in Germany, in Hamburg, they had a prostate cancer center that treated about 2,000 prostate cancers a year in one center. And they, they published their results and they had a, a very simple outcome measure that was the, the number of diapers the, the, the patient needed the year after the surgery or something. Very easy. So you can see how in, incontinent they are. And nobody wants to be incontinent after prostate surgery. Uh, and it was just compared to all the other centers and it was just lower. I think if you do something regularly, you get better. And uh, you also can get better feedback. You learn quicker. Um, uh, so there's no doubt about that. For, and I don't know the minimum number because that's always the discussion. Eh? Should you do 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 a year? I don't know, maybe 100. But in head and neck cancer, it's impossible. Nobody does 100 maxillectomies a year. Maybe in India, I don't know. Uh, Ramanesh uh, uh, can comment on that, but it's not in, in, uh, in other countries at least. So, uh, so that's impossible. But you, I think if you do one or two laryngectomies a year, you should really think, well, should I do this? Because also the aftercare, all the organization, it's not worth it. So then it's just a hobby. And, uh, and we should get away from that. And um, if you're really interested in doing laryngectomies, then go and work in a center where they do that. And if that's your, and make it your hobby over there. So, uh, and I think it's, it's time that doctors realize it's not a hobby. We should be very good at what we do. Yeah. It's an amazing point, actually. Um, at the end of the day, uh, minimizing the complications uh, it matters uh, to the patient. Um, that's good. Thank you. I think that's so. We'll move on to the panel. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen. Thank you. 